James Nestor, thank you very much for coming on and agreeing to have a chat with me. Thanks a lot for having me. To get straight into it, we are not breathing properly. I started listening to your book about a month ago, and I can only relate it, the first few chapters, similar to Matthew Walker, Why We Sleep. Straight away, I was absolutely taken back. And even after just listening to a few minutes, I then went to training and I started noticing people are mouth breathing. I started noticing when I dropped into periods of it. Talk me through for people that may, may have been as naive as I was only a month ago to your work and your discoveries and everything you're doing at the moment. Well, it seems pretty crazy that we as a species have lost the ability to breathe. And when I first heard this several years ago, I thought it was nuts until I met some researchers who said, well, if you don't believe us, why don't you just look at the skeletal record of humans? And so I did. I went to a lab, had one of the largest collections of pre-industrial skulls in the world. And all of our ancestors have a very different facial structure than we have. And they have very wide mouths. And these mouths are so wide that they can accommodate all of their teeth. Our ancestors didn't have their wisdom teeth pulled or braces. They all had straight teeth, all of them. So the reason I'm mentioning this is because with a wider mouth and with a pronathic growth of the face, you have a wider airway. So they were breathing differently than we were today. And if you look at the percentage of people who have some sort of chronic respiratory ailment, it is the vast majority of the population. What I mean by chronic respiratory ailment, uh, you've got snoring, you've got chronic sinusitis, you've got asthma, you've got COPD, you have allergies, you have constantly clogged nose, I mean, on and on and on. So it began with this question of, well, well, why? What happened? What were the changes that, that happened over a certain amount of time? And the bigger question was, well, how the hell do we fix this if, if this is so dramatically broken? But, but the premise that we are breathing incorrectly really throws people off. They say, oh, this is total BS. Until you look at yourself, until you look in the mirror, until you look at all the people you know around you, and you realize that this is so widespread that it's been just accepted to be normal, but it's not normal. I, for many years, would just think that breathing was about air in, air out, mm -hmm. mouth for eating, nose for smelling, and there'd be no connection between the two. And it was probably in lockdown when everyone went through a certain phase of exercising and I became a runner mm -hmm. and I got a Garmin and I had it and I became obsessed with the numbers. And I remember always wanting to keep my heart rate in a certain place. And I'd find that if I would stop and I would breathe just through my nose and really try and concentrate on slow, steady breaths, my heart rate would drop significantly quicker mm -hmm. than if I was panting. And I also was then trying, I, d I didn't know the science behind it, but I knew it was better to breathe through your nose. There was some almost like wives tale at school of in through your nose, out through your mouth guys, which I don't mm -hmm. think is correct mm -hmm. either. Uh, and yeah, suddenly I was like, right, there is definitely a difference breathing in through my nose. From an athletic standpoint, I think for a lot of people, you've got the benefits, but we're not just talking about that. We're talking about all of the time, right? So a lot of people think it's just important that you're breathing. If you're breathing, that's good. If you're not, that's a problem. And this is how our medical community addresses respiratory problems. Come in when you can't breathe right. <laughs> you know, it's not how you're breathing, but as you know, as, as being an athlete, it's, it's how you're breathing plays such a huge role into performance, into even lifespan, into sleep, into anxiety and more. And I think that understanding how we're breathing, just like, it's like with food, it's not just important that you're eating food, right? It depends what that food is and how you take it in and how it, how it adjusts to your body and how you respond to it. So even though a lot of, and at, at the beginning of this research, I thought there's no way that breathing could play such a huge role into anxiety and especially athletic performance and asthma and COPD. And then all you need to do is you don't really even need to, to read all of the scientific literature. There's tens of thousands of studies now in the scientific literature showing how breathing affects us into all of these areas. But all you really need to do is adjust your breathing while you're working out and to look at your heart rate, look at your heart rate variability, look at your blood pressure, and you see what a profound effect this can have on your body at any time. And especially for athletes, athletes are focused on efficiency, right? 
So you want to be burning efficiently so you can have more energy to push harder and go further. So if your breathing is out of whack, if you're breathing way more than you need to, you're expending energy you don't need to expend. And you could be using that, that energy for something else. So I, I've found in, in my experience for asthmatics and athletes are the first to notice, oh my God, this has changed my life. And then from there, a bunch of other people in different populations can, can take advantage of this. One of the people that kind of really pushed me into this area of fascination was Hickson Gracie, mm -hmm. where his book, he, he's obviously one of the hardest, most decorated fighters of all time. And he talks about the importance of breath and he goes, you can survive days without water, months without food, but minutes without the right breath and you're in a lot of trouble. And he is a, a Brazilian jiu-jitsu athlete, which is a sport uh, that I take very seriously. And after just listening to the first chapter of your book, I get to training. And I start notice mouth breathers, and uh, another one of my friends is uh, has read your book, and I nudge her, and I go, oh, "Dirty mouth breathers, look at them as a joke." And uh, now I can actually see the people that in in the sport you're sparring for say five six minutes, it's very easy to get excited and, and redline and get your heart rate up, and especially where adrenaline plays a role. And now even with my own sparring, I'm trying very hard not to break that point, and I can rest in my sport. I can lay down. I can mm -hmm. play a passive role. I can focus on breathing in and breathing out. And even when we're in positions where we're crushed or uncomfortable, I just try and keep those breaths constant and nasal. And I can already sense a difference. Mm -hmm. Whereas now if I get to the point that I feel myself panting, I'm like, I need to slow down. Mm -hmm. This is only going to detriment my performance. Breathing in martial arts has had a very tight knit relationship for a very long time. How far back are we thinking this has gone? Oh, for thousands and thousands of years. And you can read, there's about 12 books of the Tao dedicated solely to breathing. All the advantages of breathing through your nose, of controlling your breath, of holding your breath, and all the disadvantages and problems that are associated with mouth breathing. They actually thought that mouth breathing would make you sick and make you die earlier, which I think that there is some truth to that. And so you have all of this, this huge body of ancient literature pointing to how powerful breathing is and that's all fine and good but today we have machines that can measure all of this uh, which is what's so great about living in the modern world is some of these machines cost twenty thousand dollars thirty thousand uh, dollars 10 20 years ago and now they cost about a hundred dollars and you can and they're pretty accurate you can put them on your fingers or your wrists or around your neck and you can calculate how these different breathing techniques affect you uh, in no matter what you're doing. So I've done martial arts, I, at least before the pandemic, I was doing it for about 12 years straight. So when I was first researching this book, I noticed, especially during sparring, what an incredible difference it made. And you notice when your opponent is dropping their mouth open, you're like, okay, <laughs> I, got, I got them on the ropes. And you see that with boxing too. And you see this with, with other uh, very high endurance um, activities. And, and I want to be very clear. It's okay to breathe through your mouth on occasion as a tool, right? There's some basketball, basketball players who look at Steph Curry right before he dunks. Sometimes he's <gasps> takes a huge, totally fine. And, and then he goes back to breathing through, through his nose. So there, there's a time and a place for everything, but habitual mouth breathing, if you do it as part of your training and part of your competition, it's going to wear you down. And it's going to wear you down mentally, physically, uh, wear you down in so many different different ways. And this is just the mechanics of breathing. This isn't some touchy feely new age thing. This is how your body operates. I did a uh, interview with a friend of mine who's a high level wrestler, and I said to him, "You know, when do you know your opponent's beat?" And he said, "Mouth breathing." He goes, "The second I can get them panting, I know I've won." And almost everything before that was to get his opponent to start doing that before him. And I thought that was incredible mm -hmm. to be, to think of it that way. Now I'm very conscious as well when I lift weights, because whenever I try and take a gasp of air to brace myself for a squat mm -hmm. or a lift, I realize that I've got this big tendency to mouth breathe. And again, uh, as you spoke about in your book with swimming, and I've always really struggled to maintain feeling comfortable swimming. And I'm thinking now I've, you know, whether or not it's maybe a mobility issue where I'm struggling to get my mouth out or I'm closing my airways. I also think my ability to breathe is hindered in 
it's good in some sports, but it's very difficult to get in others. Mm-hmm. Well, swimming's a, a tricky one. It's really hard to breathe through your nose if you if you're swimming very very fast, right? I surf all the time. I'm in the water all the time. Surfing's a little different. You can continue breathing through your nose, but I think as long as you're exhaling through your nose while while swimming, it makes makes a huge difference. And especially if you have, can train yourself to hold your breath longer per stroke, and they've they've seen that swimmers who are able to do nine strokes. Uh, in between taking a breath, uh, it can this can have huge performance gains. This is miserable way of training. This is why so many people don't do it. It's really, really hard. But I think the more CO2 you can tolerate, the more oxygen you get. This is, seems so counterintuitive, but this is how it works, how the, how the gases break down and, and work. And so I think by using your, your breathing as, again, as this tool, the default to mouth breathing, on occasion, if you know what you're doing, you're reaching like zone, top of zone four, into zone five. Okay, you can mouth breathe for a little bit, reset your respiration, and go back to nasal breathing. Just like anything else you're, you're using as a tool. It's just interesting to me that so many athletes for so long have never considered their breathing. They're considering every single supplement they're taking. They're considering their, their sleep schedule. They're considering how many steps they're taking a day, but they're not looking at the way in which we get most of our energy is not through food and water. It's through our breath and how you take that energy in and exhale it and use it is going to dictate so much of your performance. So we've, uh, do you know what I've been, I found myself now almost being, uh, trying to convert people with this and i'm sitting mm. with people i'm like oh feel your nostril airways one slower than the other i have to convince people that this is this is real and i'm saying to them like you know we've got we need fast moving air slow moving air but it's amazing seeing people go on the journey of actually understanding this and, and learning this for themselves the even the thing the, the discomfort with holding your breath is to do with the buildup of carbon dioxide it's, a, it's to alert us isn't it and i suppose what i want to understand is when we get people to increase their lung capacity and hold their breath, are we teaching them to become comfortable with these signals? Mm-hmm. Or is it really about them adapting to become more efficient? Or is it a mix of both? Well, I think it's a it's a mix of both. But the, the first thing about being an evangelist for for breathing, this is I really have tried to state very clearly that I'm I'm not an evangelist for this stuff. My job as a reporter is to objectively provide the data and what we know about it. I have no no skin on on one side or the other to believe want to believe something and not want to why why would I want to do that? And so th- the way to convince people if that's what you want to do is to have them do it. You know, Oscar Wilde said nothing worth knowing can be taught. And and I think that a part of that is actually true. It's once you personally experience it, then you start to figure out, oh, okay, this is starting to make sense me on all these levels so you can provide them with information but you can't convince them to do something uh, especially if they're apprehensive about it uh, people have to have to come do it right and it's i don't care if they come to it uh, but what i do care about is providing the information say if you want to come over here here's some information that i learned about this subject that you might find of interest but you really have to find out for yourself and luckily breathing is unlike a diet or something Breathing is something that's free. It's accessible to everybody. We can do it anytime, anywhere. It's, it's very easy. It's, it's, it's a low bar to get into doing breathing. And even people listening to this right now can breathe into at a rate of about five to six seconds in, five to six seconds out. Just do that in a very soft way. And you can feel this change take over. So I think that's one part of it. But as, as far as uh, CO2 tolerance is concerned, what happens is that need to breathe is not dictated by oxygen. Um, and, and this is something I had gotten wrong for so long. Right now, if you exhale, you hold your breath, you're going to feel that nagging need to breathe. That is not from a lack of oxygen, but from an increase of carbon dioxide. So most of us can only tolerate a very short amount, small amount of CO2 in our bodies, especially people with asthma and anxiety. But you'd be surprised how many athletes can hold their breath for 10 seconds without going. <laughs> They're used to constantly breathing like this, which is a very inefficient way of breathing. So by allowing yourself to become more comfortable with more CO2, you can increase your circulation, you can calm your heart rate, and you can actually deliver more oxygen to your hungry cells by having more CO2. 
So the latest and greatest thing in athletic training, they've been doing this for a long time, but keeping it very secret. A lot of trainers have been doing this, but now it's, it's getting very big is the very first thing they do is assess your breathing. And they try to get that breath hold longer and longer and longer because it's a good gauge on how your body is using oxygen and how tolerant you are of CO2. I feel like, uh, even though you, you sit on the perfect line of understanding objectivity, I've, I've taken the evangelistic route to smack talk with my training partners. So if we're in like a 50, 50 round, I'm like, Oh, you're trying a bit hard. And they go, what, what do you mean? I'm like, Oh, a bit of mouth breathing. And I'm like, oh, you can't, I, I even say to someone, you can't be training that often. And they go, why'd you say that? And I go, cause you're working so hard or you'll be sore tomorrow. So I use it as like a bit of fun. But, um, one of my best friends, I, I come, she stays with me in London sometimes. And I go into my room and on my pillow, she's left some tape. And she's, she's a month ahead of me on the, on the book at this stage. And she comes into my room and she's as a joke, she actually has done it a few times. She's got tape on her lips and she goes, you need to try it. I think that I've taken it from her. What I'd love to tell people about is the experiments in which you've done, beginning with plugging your nose for 10 days. And I, I say to people, oh, you know, it's really important to breathe through your nose. And I say, look, I've been reading this book. This guy, James, he, uh, he plugged his nose for 10 days. And people straight away, they go, oh, that sounds horrible. What was it really like mm. restricting your airways for mm. 10 days through your nose? Well, it sounds horrible until you talk to about 50% of the population who struggles with a uh, chronically stuffed nose. And if you talk to the 15% of the population that suffers from chronic sinusitis, until you talk to people who suffer from allergies and you realize about half of us are contending with a stuffed nose throughout a lot of the year. Uh, it's so common. People who mouth breathe at night, 50% of them will wake up with a stuffed nose. So it seems like a jackass stunt. It was never intended to be that. Um, people are like, oh, yeah, I, I, I dig it. You know, you're trying to make yourself miserable and talk. I said, no, what we're trying to do is lull ourselves into a position that so much of the population already knows. But, but the difference was we were calculating what happened to our bodies during, during this. And so we, we did this with Stanford University with the chief of rhinology research there, who's top of the field. And he had been curious about this for a long time, but he told me, he's like, I could never recruit people to do this because I, I felt it was unethical as a rhinologist. So by me volunteering, it was this perfect subject. He's just like, cool, let's, let's do it. They've done animal studies with this, which are terrible. Don't, don't read them. They never done a human study and the maximum amount of time we were allowed to do it was 10 days. So we plugged our noses for 10 days. Me and one other person, uh, we had to pay for the study. So he had no money. Stanford <laughs> didn't have money for it. <laughs> Interesting. But, uh, uh, you know, he had not allocated money in that year to do this. So we had to pay for it. The maximum amount of, of people we could do was two. And we plugged our noses and we took data three times a day. We took a huge amount of data uh, before we plugged our noses, 10 days after, and then 10 days after nasal breathing, um, including a lot of blood work, uh, PFTs. I mean, ev everything we could do about eight hours a day, each, each of those times. And you know, the, the short version is it was, it was awful. It was so much worse than, than anyone thought. And not just according to me, my subjective experience, but that's what the, the data showed us, uh, right off the bat, blood pressure changes, sleep changes, anxiety changes. I mean, athletic performance changes. And so you, you think about at the end of that, I was like, God, what about all these kids who walk around with the stuff nose all the time? They say, my sleep is terrible. I can't focus. I can't run very well. Uh, you know, I'm getting very jittery all the time. It, it's so sad that we have not been able to diagnose and treat those chronic problems. And, and instead it's just assumed that it's normal in wintertime to have a chronically stuffed nose. So that, that was what we took away from it. I can get into the details if, if you want, uh, the, the gory details. We can do that as well. I think that uh, every, since reading the book as well now, I'm spending times where I just breathe and I'm, I'm happy that I can breathe. And do you know, we've had a very cold period. A lot of people, uh, my nephew, my sister, everyone's getting colds at the moment. I think mm -hmm. since I've become more conscious of nose breathing, I like to think that I've got a stronger immunity at the moment. I'm, I'm hey guys, I'm, I'm practicing my nasal breathing right. I even, whilst listening to your audiobook, text one of my best friends who I, I broke his nose in a game of rugby by accident. We clashed heads and he's had, he went straight to the hospital 
And they said, we're not touching your nose uh, until you stop playing rugby. We're not going to break it back. We're not going to, because you can make it worse. The airways are Mm -hmm. obviously very important. But I know that he has struggled breathing and it's been years. And I was thinking about the accumulative damage which a broken airway in the nasal cavity could have on him. And uh, I kind of said to him, are you you going to get that fixed? Are you Mm going to get it straightened? Are you going to get this sorted? It now became a concern of mine. With injuries that occur to the nose, is this a big issue? It's a huge issue. And what happened to your friend is very typical of how we have been looking at breathing. We're like, oh, you you can't breathe through your nose, so you got a mouth. So just breathe through that. And if you want to get this fixed at some later time in life, we can do that. Uh, It's a very twisted way of, of looking at how we get most of our energy and, and we know that how you breathe is going to affect your blood pressure. It's going to affect your metabolism. It's going to affect your sleep, all of this. And if you have a severely broken nose or a severely deviated septum or polyps, whatever, this can cause extreme stress to your body all the time. It doesn't matter what food you're eating, how much you're exercising. You're always going to be playing catch up all the time because if you struggle to do anything for 20,000 times a day, 25,000 times a day for people on the higher end of that, it's going to break you down and it may not break you down after a couple of months. It could be a couple of years, but, but eventually it's going to win. And so, so much of the population is getting by breathing, right? They're breathing through their noses or, or barely through one nose or they're breathing through their mouths, but that doesn't mean they're healthy. There's a difference between compensating and health. And so with, with your friend, uh, I think it's imperative to establish proper nasal breathing. And the dozens and dozens and dozens of scientists I've talked to and researchers have said that same thing. You will never really be healthy unless you're an obligate nasal breather, period. That's it. It's very, it's powerful. I'll send that snippet to him. Now, this could be slightly controversial and I'm not mm-hmm. trying to throw you under the bus. Masks. Mm-hmm. Pandemic. To me. Uh, you know, someone says vaccine, I'm like, yeah, cool. Masks, they they drive me crazy. Mm-hmm. I wear them in situations I must. But I feel like I can't breathe properly in mm-hmm. them. What is your kind of stance on masks? You're wearing one very kindly when I met you today. Um, is this hindering people's ability to breathe? Is this playing and negating our function to breathe properly? To me, one of the the big blind spots and one of the very irresponsible things that was done by government was to say, everybody, you need to wear a mask, go on with your day, go on with your night. That's bad advice for, for this one reason. And the reason is you have to breathe differently when you're wearing a mask. Do masks inhibit our ability to get oxygen. No, they do not. And there's been many studies that have shown this. I've done my own studies with this wearing three masks with a pulse oximeter. It makes no difference. Do CO2 levels increase when we're wearing a mask? Sometimes. Do people default to mouth breathing when they're wearing a mask? Uh, One estimate I saw was about 80% of people breathe through their mouth. So this is one of the reasons why so many people are getting mask mouth. They're having periodontal disease. They're, They're having all these dental issues because they're breathing through their mouths. So what government should have done, in my opinion, is say, okay, you need to wear a mask in these certain situations. You need to breathe this way when you're wearing a mask. You need to always be breathing through your nose. You need to be breathing slowly and calmly. Instead, people have this false sense of security that they're wearing a mask and they're just huffing and puffing away. Go to any airport. I know you've been to quite a few of them last month and check out all these masks that are going up and down and up and down where the, where the mouth area is. It's the majority of people. So I get asked this question all the time. I did a very deep dive in it. I talked to the researchers who had done these studies and the O2 thing is not an issue. If it were an issue, then every dentist and surgeon would be deficient in oxygen and they would have been deficient in oxygen for the last 70 years. Not an issue, but it's how people breathe in their masks, which is an issue. And I have to wear a mask as as often as you do in airports. I've been traveling around a lot. When I put on a mask, I take it as an opportunity to focus on my breathing, to slow it down, to only breathe through my nose the whole time. And if you take the mask as, as, as that, it's like, okay, now I have this incentive to breathe in this way that will calm my body down. I think you can turn something that is a complete pain in the butt into something that is a tool to help you breathe a little better. 
I found myself doing this. Now you say that where I want to breathe less wearing a mask. So I slow it down. I focus a lot more on it. I get to a point where I can barely feel that I'm breathing. Mm -hmm. And I feel aggravated where I see people in their car on their own wearing a mask or walking down the street on their own. And I understand that yeah. they probably have the best intentions. Yeah. They, they're like, do you know what? I'm going to wear the mask for the other 30% of the journey to keep people around me safe or, you know, whatever it is. But I, I can sense that people aren't breathing properly. And one, one part of the discussion I wanted to get into was uh, with nostril. I found myself going down a rabbit hole on YouTube about a year ago of nostrils swapping sides. You know, you'll see someone sat there breathing on their fingers and they're like, oh, it's changed. And trying to explain to people we need slow moving air, fast moving air. You're going to be much better at explaining this to, to people. Mm. Why is it phenomena of nostrils swapping sides and why is it we need air traveling at different speeds? So our nostrils are covered with erectile tissue. This is the same erectile tissue that's in our genitals, okay? And it responds in the same way. Some people have too close of a connection, which is why when they get sexually excited, they'll start sneezing or they'll get a, an extremely stuffed nose. Luckily, most of us don't, don't have that issue. But I mention that because it's the same exact tissue. So it engorges with blood and becomes flaccid just like both those areas were working the same way. We're moving on from the X-rated version of this talk. Don't, don't worry. I had to establish that foundation first. So the reason why our nostrils are covered in this stuff is because throughout the day, one nostril will open after about 30 minutes to three to four hours. It varies when you get sick. This happens much more quickly is the other nostril will open as the other closes. So it goes back and forth. Sometimes they both open and it will just keep going back and forth. So we've known about this since 1895, they discovered this, but no one knew why our nostrils would possibly want to do this. Why would we evolve this ability to do this until people started looking into the ancient yogi tradition of Nadi Shodhana, uh, which is alternate nostril breathing. Anyone that's been in a yoga class has probably done this. Well, why do yogis do that, right? Um, so what they found with scientific studies, and there's dozens of these things now, is that inhaling air and exhaling air through different nostrils affects your body in a different way. So through the left, inhaling and exhaling calms your body down. The heart rate will lower. Your blood pressure will lower. The right side of the brain will become more stimulated and you'll become cooler, right? So inhaling through the right is associated with heating the body up blood pressure goes up, heart rate goes up. And, you know, again, this isn't some, some thought by some yogi who would put it together. You can measure these things and it's been measured numerous times. So even though this is not absolutely conclusive, it's still considered theoretical, but to me, it seems pretty obvious why our bodies do this and why the timing of that switches depending on our health. I believe and so many other researchers believe this is the way the body tries to be balanced throughout the day, tries to keep you in that state of homeostasis. Um, and it's using your breathing to do this. So that's one of the benefits to breathing through the nose. There are about 30 others. Um, you mentioned, uh, is it keeping me healthier? Uh, it could be because in the nose is uh, much more of a profusion of nitric oxide that is released and that interacts directly with viruses and bacteria. So our nose is our first line of defense and also keeping your body calm and not stressed out is also good for your, your immune function. So will it keep you from getting COVID? Probably not. Will it keep you from ever getting sick? No. Will it help bolster your immune function? Yes. And what's wrong with that? It could bolster it a little bit or it could bolster it a lot, you know, but you're still getting a benefit from it. Am I correct in thinking that the nostril petitioning would be parasympathetic, sympathetic. Mm, that's exactly right. Yeah. So then uh, this is a kind of a, an argument I have with people where I like to explain to them we have central nervous system, sympathetic, parasympathetic, and people talk about the benefits of fasting. And uh, I, I fully understand where people are going and they seem to say fasting gives them amazing clarity. But I say, no, 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 eating makes you tired. And that's fine. That's normal because rest and digest the parasympathetic nervous system, we should have peaks and troughs throughout the day. Waking up should be sympathetic. Having something to eat and relaxing should be parasympathetic. And people forget we have these peaks and troughs. They forget that we need to swap from one to the other and that 
homeostatic balance in which you talk about, I completely agree with where people need to appreciate they can't just wake up at six and be stressed and be sympathetic all the way through till 6 p.m. when their boss leaves. There need to be these, these gaps in between. And my breathing actually changes. If I'm relaxing watching TV, uh, especially if I've got a partner at the time, they think I've fallen asleep because my breathing mm. switches into parasympathetic. And they look over their shoulder like, oh, you're awake. And I'm like, what? They go, your, your breathing just changed. I thought you fell asleep. And for people to even notice those changes that go on, it's, it's incredible and something that I never really noticed until I was older. So your, your state, how relaxed you are, is going to affect your breathing, but your breathing can also affect your state which is what I think is makes this such a powerful tool. And I was talking to Dr. Andrew Huberman. I don't know if you know him. Yeah, he's, he's, he's so smart. He's, he's down at Stanford. I've known him for, for years, actually. And, uh, you know, he said that the most effective way of resetting your respiration and dealing with stress, more effective than anything else, is to take this physiological sigh. So this is two breaths. And you let it out. You don't push it. Like as Westerners, we always want to kick everything's ass. Like I'm going to kick that diet's ass. I'm going to kick my competitor's ass. But, but breathing is something that, that you should look at as a nurturing thing, that you should work with it, you know, not, not fight against it. So by taking those, those two breaths, one on top of the other, and then letting that breath out and doing this four times, and then going into the same breathing pattern, when you're sleeping, it's beautiful listening to people breathe when they sleep because it's, it's this very smooth. It's so soft. It's like waves. Same thing. Listen to your dog, like breathe. And it's very smooth and soft that if you breathe that way, you will send your body messages that you are relaxed and you are in a safe place. So those tools and uh, can be used at any time to, to shift your state. And, you know, the samurai used to do this before they would let someone become a samurai. They, they would hold, they'd hold the feather. So uh, to me, it's a real big tell to see someone's mental state, to see how anxious they are by just looking at their breathing and looking at their chest. If you can see someone breathing, if you can hear them breathing, they're breathing in a very dysfunctional way. And there, there's chances, uh, big chance, if they're breathing uh, over breathing and you can really see them that they're in a in a very heightened sympathetic state before off air i told you i was training jiu-jitsu in austin lex friedman i believe andrew huberman have trained in the gym that i train with mm -hmm. so uh lex is a black belt mm -hmm. andrew i think is a bit more novice but his content i i save a lot of his posts sometimes i think i'm not intelligent enough to read this but then when he digests it and breaks it down the stuff he he's bringing to the table, I think, is is brilliant. Now, with jujitsu, I found myself. It's interesting to say about the too aggressive breathe, breathing in, breaths in. I do this whenever I can get to a position where I can expand my rib cage, because mm -hmm. we spend a lot of time in jujitsu curved and mm -hmm. uh, concave to protect ourselves, and we're always hunching over. And whenever I get to a position, whether it's technical mount or a top position, I find myself taking these aggressive breaths into inhale and to almost reset and to get to mm -hmm. a position to, and it calms me down especially if i've just had to work hard to get a top position and i actually remember someone i used to train with doing it and i've picked it up from training with him <laughs> just hearing him hearing when he breathes hearing when he takes the aggressive breaths in when he resets and there are so many positions in the sport where you can relax while the other person's taxed mm -hmm. and now i found myself almost creating a hunger to notice how people breathe when they're deciding to breathe and it's already such a, a big intricate game of chess not only is there the physical part of it there's also the calming breathing and relaxing part of it that's so important in a fight mm -hmm. and we've been talking a lot about how you can use breathing to calm yourself which is so important because a lot of people stay in this state of low-grade stress throughout their whole lives, which is why the vast majority of modern diseases are tied to chronic inflammation, be that diabetes or heart disease or hypertension. That's just what it is. And, and people have a hard time understanding that. And you start looking at these diseases and you realize how true that is. But you can also use your breathing to amp your body up because you don't always want to be chilled out, especially when, when you're fighting, you know, maybe sometimes you want to store up some, some energy real quick, but you want to be amped up and ready to go. And that's why I think these very 
aggressive breathing techniques uh, can be so effective. They can be effective for athletic performance, which is why if you increase your breathing rate before two minutes before you're about to do some really intense cardio work, you know, the first, like when you start cold doing intense cardio work, it's miserable. Like the first five minutes, you're like, how am I possibly going to do this for an hour until your respiration catches up? And after about 10 minutes, you're like, right on, I can just keep going. So if you adjust your breathing before that and get your circulation going and start ramping your body up, I've, I've noticed this in, in my own personal workouts, it's so much easier to get into that zone. So by using this intense breathing as well has been shown to be very effective for anxiety, depression, even some autoimmune issues. You can call it Wim Hof method. You can call it Sudarshan Kriya. You can call it Pranayama. It's all doing the same thing. It's using breathing to purposely put your body in a sympathetic state. And then it's using breathing to purposely turn that sympathetic state down into a parasympathetic state. So you become the controller of your nervous system and to some degree, your immune function. And that's a really powerful thing to take a hold of and start to understand. For so many years, I, I wanted Wim Hof to be wrong. I wanted, you know, seeing this person ice baths and almost punishing himself. I know the benefits of cold water therapy, but mm -hmm. I just love hot showers and hot baths. And um, it, it's interesting because sometimes I, I, to polarize audiences on social media, I have a pop at cold water therapy. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I've had an ice bath. I just do it with warm water. But I actually like using the sea. Uh, when I live in Bondi for the majority of the year, a lot of the time, mm. I feel a lot better going into cold water than I do hot. And I remember a friend of mine saying to me, like, if you start panting as you get into the water, it's going to feel a lot colder. He said, as we walk out, just try and maintain your breath the whole time. Mm. I thought, nah, this is rubbish. And if I could control my breathing, I could control my heart rate, and I could manage the cold water much easier, mm. spend a lot more time there. And when you do get out and the water gets up to your neck, it seems so bizarre that just focusing on breathing in and breathing out and not letting your impulses get carried away makes the whole experience so much enjoyable. Mm -hmm. And people are now taking this to quite extreme mm -hmm. kind of positions. And there's nowhere else you can really point the finger to than their breathing. And mental focus can tie into that once you get good enough at breathing. And so I think what has happened is a lot of people see the benefits of meditation at the beginning, especially in newbie. It's like, wow, meditation is really this amazing thing. The vast majority of those benefits come from the breathing you're doing during that meditation. After years of meditating, you can start using your mind to do some crazy things. And there's some meditators who can take control of their heart rate, right? Could shift their blood pressure around their bodies. That takes years and years and years. The vast majority is breathing. And I get asked about the question of ice baths a lot. And I don't talk about this often, but you brought it up. So I, I figured I might, might share. I, you know, I'm someone who grew up in Southern California. Uh, we had a place in Palm Springs as well. I'm a warm weather person. I cannot stand cold. I, I can't stand cold water. I I hate ice baths. Uh, I'll just, I've tried it. Wim has been like, oh, come on, you got to go for it. He even issued me a challenge uh, a couple of months ago. I was like, oh, I'm traveling right now. Sorry, yeah. man. Um, uh, it's something I do want to get better at because I want to be able to swim in San Francisco. Uh, the water is very cold there. I want to be able to do that. But I just don't know if I have the body type or the mental capacity to do it. Uh, luckily, it's not like, Ice baths are the end all be all. It's like, oh, you have to do not. If you're ever going to be healthy, there's so many other things you can do that can elicit the same effects of, of bathing in ice water, right? You can take control of your breathing. You can adjust your food. You can adjust your exercise, your sleep. So uh, I do know that there are profound benefits to it for some people, especially people with autoimmune issues and arthritis. That's being studied right now. But me personally, it's it's not something uh, I'm I'm too comfortable with. I'll be honest. We'd agree with the keep your benefits for this one. It's it's interesting you talk about uh, meditation. I mean, it's something that I don't use too much. But in the last year or so, interestingly enough, I took some psychedelics with a group of friends, and 
when taking magic mushrooms, we sit, we relax, we think, we listen to music, often Hans Zimmer, and we reflect. And then we try to get back to that state through listening to the same music, sitting the same way, mm. breathing the same way. And taking two, three minutes out of my day to begin, although I'm listening to music, the first thing that you're taught to think about is your breath. They say, if you're thinking about breathing, you're not thinking about anything else. So we sit, we get comfortable. And like you say, your breaths become longer, more intentful, slower. You start thinking about, hold on, was I breathing really fast before? The benefits in the first minute alone, you're actually using your lungs. You're actually taking a little pause. You're getting a good rhythm. I completely agree that sometimes sitting in a room off your phone and away from notifications for a few minutes, just sitting and breathing distractionless is the first part of the benefits. And as your mind starts to wander, I even feel that the places my mind wanders to are the places that it should have probably wandered to earlier in the day when I had the distractions. I don't like the narrative that meditation is just for hippies who want to find you know, peace with themselves. It's almost like a little investment into, into your mind and your body with setting some proper time to not only think without distraction, but to breathe without distraction. Well, yeah, we don't live in an environment in which we have any break from anything nowadays. And we had evolved to have constant breaks through, throughout the day, right? We weren't always working. Even hunter-gathered tribes, that the, the cultures, the ones that are still there, they work about three hours a day. So people think like, oh, you know, we used to work 12 hours a day. It was just a grind. No, no not really. So the day was set up with those valleys and peaks of of being an athlete and exercising and then not doing anything back and forth, being able to stare at the sky or the tree. So it's ironic that we now have to prescribe time to do something that just came naturally before. But it's also ironic that we need to relearn how to eat and relearn how to walk and relearn how to exercise all these things that our ancestors need never needed to do because the environment was naturally conducive to us participating in all these things throughout the day. So if that, you know, if you need to set up a timer to, to have that, those five minutes of, of peace and quiet, then absolutely. And we know the benefits of this. No one's, I, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a scientist who said there's no benefits to spending 10 minutes um, focusing on your breath or there's no benefits to even spending five minutes to just calmly staring at the wall or closing your eyes and being conscious and breathing at this certain rate. Of course there is. You give your mind a break, your body a break as well. Just we're so detached from nature right now that we've had to build in. We call them, we call this biohacking or hacking now, but it's really returning to what we were naturally designed to do. And breathing is a huge part of that. I find that I don't have a huge amount of anxiety in my life, but I do actually when I travel. I, it's, I'm a bit of a control freak. There are a lot of variables, especially at the moment with passenger locator forms. You've got your COVID test. You've got all of these things. And whenever I feel myself becoming slightly overwhelmed with these emotions, I, I do this a lot in Ubers. Put my headphones in and I go, I'm going to spend an entire song. That's all I say. One song, probably Hans Zimmer again, just breathing. And there's never been a time that I've come out the other side in a net worse position. Not even net neutral. Every single time I feel calmer. I feel like uh, I'm in a better headspace. I feel like I've progressed. And people listening to this, that probably right now, people are walking around. They've got their dogs. They've got their kids. They're walking around a park. They're there taking note of it. I think it's such an important thing that people take these little resets out to see, okay, starting with three and a half minutes, does this benefit my mood? Does it benefit my anxiety? Does it benefit my mindfulness? And if yes, we need to make sure these are integrated into daily life. I do the same exact thing. I've been traveling a lot for the last three months, like various borders, pretty stressful stuff. What I do is I try not to take that moment before because you know how aggro it is going through customs. You need all of your mental faculties lined up. And I actually find it being more advantage to be a little stressed out because I can just focus and get things done. But once I'm through and I'm waiting the obligatory hour and a half to get on the plane, I always do that. I put in my headphones and it makes it a very smooth transition to the time where I'm out and about to the time I'm sitting 
in, in a seat on an airplane to the time I'm able to go to sleep. And the headphones help with that. Uh, I also wear earplugs a lot, um, maybe a little too much, and especially in airports. And I noticed having less distractions around once you're locked in, okay, once you, you don't have to talk to anyone with earplugs in, but you've got your seat number, everything's all, all set and ready to go, and you're just standing in the queue for, for 45 minutes. But just earplugs and having that silence where you can hear your breath, you can hear your heart rate, you're more connected with your body is it becomes incredibly tranquil for me. And again, this isn't some new age hypothesis. This is you taking control of your own functions, your interoception, you are able to sink in a little further into our most basic biological functions and, and to control them and calm yourself. And I think without these little hacks, uh, you have these hacks for a reason. I have these hacks for a reason. You just get burned out and, and you never want to go anywhere. And, and I'm liking being back out in the world right now. So, You know, um, when your bag is taken for the security scanners, what also, I haven't really told anyone this, I, I definitely have an issue with not having my phone on me because the second I have to put it in a tray, I feel like naked. I feel like someone's just taken mm -hmm. my clothes and all my valuables often live in my backpack in that tray. Mm -hmm. When it goes through the security scanners, peak anxiety. And now in the last probably month or so, that's when I try my hardest to breathe mm -hmm. slowly. And I've really, and my, fr and my friends, I haven't even told them. And you know, when you stood there and you're waiting for it to come through, I'm just there, just taking a deep breath and I can feel my heart rate racing and I'm trying not to let it. And I'm just trying to distract myself and I'm just stood there thinking about other things and it helps. And it's, it's such a strange one where you can kind of anticipate these peaks and try and manage them because I think everyone has that same feeling when they travel. Everyone has that, but not everyone really knows the tools that they can have at their disposal to make it easier. So every time I put bags through the, we have many similarities here with our travel neuroses. I've noticed I take, I, I restart my respiration with those physiological size right before I go through the the detector right it makes you look look less suspicious too especially if you haven't slept in a while and and look scruffy um and and then as i'm waiting for my bag i will be taking those very calm breaths as well uh you know i get stopped a lot i don't know what it is and uh they are going to respond much better if you're calm if you're collected if you're clear than if you're super aggro and infuriated uh you're not going to get anywhere doing that so all of these anxious times throughout the day, wearing a mask, losing your phone, trying to get through customs. Again, I wouldn't look at these as a time to be negative or stressed, but take them as opportunities to control your breathing. You will never uh, not have some degree of, of benefit, a lot of double negatives there, but uh, some of those benefits may be very small. Some of them could be very large, but you're always going to be ahead by doing this. So, so why on earth wouldn't you want to do it? One of the kind of more important topics, I want to talk about sleep and sleep mm -hmm. breathing. Sleep apnea is something that is a big issue in a lot of lives and it's not in mainstream conversations. And I suppose sleep apnea is almost the discontinuation of proper sleeping, of breathing during sleep. What are the kind of key discoveries and progressions that you've made in the area of sleep breathing because so i've seen you do some q a's with mm -hmm. matthew walker as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um to see you guys together i was mm -hmm. like this is the combination mm -hmm. we need in the world <laughs> he was i was lucky enough to be speaking at the same conference with with him and they let me do a q a with him uh, and i had so many questions i had read his book years ago and had too many questions for him but he, you know, it agrees with me that you will never have good sleep if you have poor breathing. And so a lot of people are focused on their aura ring and they're focused on their posture when they're sleeping. And they're focused on the time that they're going to sleep and the time that they're waking up. All important things. If you are struggling to breathe while you're sleeping, you're never going to sleep well and you're never going to be healthy. Period. So sleep disorder breathing, that's the big umbrella term they use for sleep apnea, for snoring, and something called upper airway resistance syndrome. So people who fall 
in between the cracks, which so many people do, where you're not diagnosed with snoring, you're not diagnosed with sleep apnea, you must be okay, go away, but you still have all of these downstream negative health effects from this. This is upper airway resistance syndrome. So it turns out that a huge percent of the of the population, it depends what population you're looking at, and these, these percentages change a little bit all the time, but it's about 20% of the population has sleep apnea. And I think it's the percentage is about 80% of those with moderate and severe uh, are undiagnosed or aren't using anything for this. I mean, this is, this is a catastrophe. And you wonder why so many people have all of these issues. And I, I didn't know until I read Walker's book and until I started talking to scientists that even adult onset diabetes is linked to, to sleep apnea. Who would have thought like that? I was like, how is this even possible? Alzheimer's, ADHD, increased risk of heart disease, stroke, on and on and on. So to me, the very first thing that people should be doing is assessing their airway health. That's number one. Can you breathe through your nose? Are you choking on the back of your throat? It doesn't matter about the breathing techniques you're doing. You have to be able to have a clear airway. After that, assess your breathing during sleep. Are you snoring? Do you have sleep apnea? Do you have upper airways resistance syndrome? And then after that, you can start moving on to uh, focusing on your breathing in all these different ways. But I was so shocked going into the community of experts and learning that we've known about this for decades and decades. and No one's doing anything. Well, I won't say no. Very few people are taking it seriously, I think is how I, how I should rephrase that. And this is one of the most serious in my opinion, one of the most serious health issues facing us right now. I would say that when I drink alcohol, I'm much more inclined to snore. What is it about alcohol that impairs our ability to breathe properly? It relaxes all those tissues. It relaxes you. So, right? That's when you're very, very relaxed back there. It's the same thing why if you were to take tranquilizers or sleeping pills, People think that sleeping pills are helping them sleep. Talk to Matthew Walker about this, who's the world expert. He said, this is a catastrophe. Not only will it make you more apt to suffer from snoring and sleep apnea and other airway issues, but the sleep you have from sleeping pills is drastically different than natural sleep. So I'm not saying don't drink alcohol, but but just understand that it will affect your the quality of your sleep in many ways. And there's some things you can do to, to help reduce some of those issues drink earlier for one uh we do know that hyperventilating can help you off gas alcohol ethanol so you can actually hyperventilate yourself to a more sober state true there, there's a new device that helps you do this <laughs> i prefer the device that that we're born with our, our lips and our lungs that that works pretty well so the whole idea of wim hof method like being really able to help you get sober it looks like there's some science behind that so, uh, you, you know, uh, when we're talking about like healthy eating, healthy breathing and all that, the, these are tips. We live in a modern society, right? So you can't always be perfect all the time. And that's not what this is about. It's, it's to know what is right and what is wrong and to use those things at the right time to help bolster your, your health. I've become uh, fascinated with my relationship to sleep and alcohol since Matthew Walker's book. But now with the breathing side of it, it is when I'm, I have to warn people, if I've been drinking, don't let me fall asleep on my back because that's right. when I'm going to mouth breathe. Yep. That's when I'm going to snore. I've even found that if I'm in somewhere like Bali where the air conditioning is a little bit old, I know that I drink, I'm going to snore, I'm going to mouth breathe. I'm going to wake up with a sore throat from mouth breathing in air from an air conditioning unit that gives me a sore throat. Then I feel like I'm getting ill. Suddenly all these little knock on effects that can occur from it, like you say, I'm still going to drink, but I need to understand the implications that has not just on being hungover on a bad night's sleep, what that's going to do to my immune system. I'm probably going to end up eating more because of that and training worse. Okay. And where you talk about type two diabetes being correlated with the poor night's sleep and sleep apnea, 100%. And we see this really vicious degrading circle where negative habits create more negative kind of outcomes, which then create even more negative outcomes and people are on this slippery slope downhill where not sleeping well, tend to eat more, less inclined to exercise. And mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, the first thing I'm shocked to hear is that uh, the air conditioning units aren't aren't first grade up in up in Bali. That that's the thing that really stops me. I've I've been there, so I, I can relate to what you're saying. You, you know, if you really want to get into this, uh, what they used to do in the military and what what the Russians have done for a very long time is you can wear a t-shirt and you can tape something to the back of that t-shirt, uh, a ping pong ball, a sock, whatever you have, a roll of tape. It do- doesn't matter. And this will just train you when you're unconscious and rolling around. Your body's going to say, that's super uncomfortable to be on my back. So I want to be on my side or this side. Another thing you can do is raise the head of the bed about six inches, which can really help. And when you go to sleep, sleep on your left side, not on your right side. So the stomach naturally hangs in that direction. So so does the uh, pancreas. And you get better lymph fluid. Uh, 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 circulation and it actually helps with your heart. So if you go to sleep, uh, man, I, we could make a billion dollars with this, helping drunk people sleep better. Why, why are we giving this away? So, so do the t-shirt trick, incline bed therapy. If you can't incline the bed, put an extra pillow there, sleep on your left side. And I think you'll be surprised that your, your sleep quality will be a lot better. I think I've, uh, seen this before where a long time ago, there were pajamas with a little pocket to put an acorn in. And that was what uh, wives used to do with their husbands. And they would, uh, yeah, or a conquer, one of the two, they'd put it in and they would feel that discomfort and they'd roll over. Uh, and one of my kind of things that I've discovered in the last few years is to sleep with a pregnancy pillow. So I think we need to change the name of it. It's a big C-shaped pillow, which promotes side sleeping. You can't really sleep on your back with it. And um, yeah, I, I actually now travel with one when I can. I do long haul. So you can get a long tubular pillow. You have to carry a, an entire duffel bag to cram it in. And you do get some incredibly strange looks from air stewardesses. But then some of them, is, if you're fortunate enough to fly business class, if you think of the amount of the cost of the flight and the ticket and then the size of the pillow, I see a big problem. I'm like, hold on a second. You're paying so much money for this comfort. But you can't, because me, I need something between my knees. I need to be in like a, a, a straight line. And having that pillow with me means that I sleep better flying long haul. It just means that my hand luggage is all one pillow. It's fascinating. You know, I'm realizing that your nervousness about your phone um, going through security probably has less to do with your phone and more to do with the pregnancy pillow. When when the guys on the other side say, what the hell is this? <laughs> say, well, well, sir, it's a, it's a pregnancy pillow. Um, but, you know, if you are into doing these long haul flights as, as I am, you become a complete weirdo. Uh, and I, I've got my whole systems too. I, I have not gotten onto the long pillow thing, but, but I'm, I'm taking that as, as a note. I think you do whatever you can to try to get some sleep. At, at least I do. So the, the side sleeping thing is we, we've known this for a long time, so much more charming to put an acorn in, in your pajamas. That, that seems so like, like sweet, uh, rather than taping a duct taping a ball to the back of it, but whatever the hell you want to put back there. Uh, I've done this because I was noticing I was sleeping on my back. I wasn't snoring when I, when I would be drinking, but I wouldn't, I would notice my, uh, I would notice mouth breathing a lot more. I would notice that uh, I would be congested uh, in the morning after drinking. I was like, oh, I wonder how much of that is the alcohol or how much of that is the eight hours of, of breathing in this different way. So I've noticed huge, huge uh, benefits from, from doing this. And again, these all the hacks we're mentioning beyond, I don't know how much a pregnancy pillow costs, but the, these are cheap things to, to do. If they don't work for you, that's, that's cool. Cause how much did you spend? Zero, zero dollars. Yeah. It's probably the pillows cost maybe between 30 and $50. Okay. And I, I say this, I'm some environmentalists are going to go crazy. I said, even if I left it on the plane, which I don't, that would have cost 1% of the flight costs. Yeah. So 1% cost increase, 40% more comfort. Yeah. If not more. Yeah. Yeah. And it, you know, when I, when I say to people about that, it can seem crazy and so trivial. Same with a travel pillow, even a short flight. Okay. That's a two for 20 pounds, 10 pound pillow. Would that improve my sleep by even just a fraction or being able to put my head against something as I sleep? Uh, I think that for many people, they're missing out on, on these kind of hacks rather than taking a diazepam or a Valium. Right. Right. You know, take a travel pillow. Those, those things. And, and there's no doubt that those, those drugs will put you to sleep, I, that's a, a better term would be, they will make you unconscious, <laughs> but you are not going to be having the, the sleep you would 
be having otherwise, which is why I took one, I think I took an Ambien years and years ago. Uh, I had never taken one. I was like, everyone else is doing this. We're going to take this on this, on this long flight. It was, uh, yeah, I went unconscious immediately. I I've never felt more terrible for, for days after and everyone's different, right? Some people take these things every night. They say they're great, but I think it's to find whatever works for you. And, and to me, the things that have the lowest threshold, right? How much does it cost? How much is it, is it going to be a, a trouble for me to do this? Uh, those are things to consider. And if you think of the things that we're mentioning, this is why I wear three jackets whenever I get on a plane and I take two of them off and I roll one up and I put it on my back and put the other one up here, you know, so there's all these hacks you get to know. But at the end of this, the most important thing is it's like, what's your sleep quality? Not, not the, the quantity, but, but what is the quality of that sleep and how are you breathing during that? And, uh, they, those two things are tied so closely together. And I don't think we've been looking at that close enough. Uh, one of the final points in your book, you talk about mouth taping during sleep to ensure that you promote nasal breathing. The tape seems quite invasive. And although uh, mm -hmm. while my friend Lucy was staying with me, I kept finding this tape on my bed. I jokingly got my eye mask and I put it over the top of my forehead and used it as a chin strap to keep my mouth closed. Is there potentially a viable world we live in where, you know, you could get an eye mask that at the same time holds your jaw up. Would this be enough to stop people mouth breathing? Are there devices out there that are effective that aren't continuous pressure airways machines? I think you've got your whole new line of products here to, to, to go and market. Uh, you can find advertisements that are about 130 years old of these chin straps. Okay. So people have been on to this, not only the, the acorn pajamas were, were those a hip thing, but these very elaborate, crazy chin straps that would just keep your mouth shut at night because they knew the quality of sleep would, would change if you're breathing through your nose. So to me, I'm not saying one way is better than the other. I'm saying, do what works for you. Uh, just make sure you're breathing through your nose at night. Uh, very, very important. I found the tape works great for me. I thought I would only have to use tape for a few weeks and then I would learn out of habit to keep my mouth shut. That works for a lot of people. They only need to use it for a very short amount of time. I'm not one of those people. So whenever I don't have tape, my mouth opens. I feel it immediately. When I wake up, my mouth is dry. My nose is a little stuffed up. My sleep quality suffers. I can see that with whatever wearable you want to wear. So I travel with this stuff right now. At my hotel is a little roll of tape. And I am so bummed if I lean over and start tearing the, and I don't have enough. I'm like, oh God, I have to go down and, and get some tape somewhere. It's become that bad because I, I don't think it's because, or not just because I'm a total neurotic, but I know the quality of my next day is going to severely suffer depending on the quality of my sleep and the quality of that sleep, at least for me, the number one most important thing is how I'm breathing and breathing through the nose. Well, this has been such an informative episode. I'm so excited. Even as someone who's read the book, I was excited to ask you some questions. I think that all of the listeners and viewers that have been watching this will, it will revolutionize their life. Is there any, you've got your book, which is uh, breathe, oh, Breath, The Science of the Lost Art. I call it Breathe, Dyslexic. Uh, is there anything you want to promote? Have you got any speaking events, just the book? I know the audio book is fantastic as well for people that want to do it. This is your moment to plug and promote. Mm. <laughs> well, I won't do that, but uh, the website, most of what we've been talking about, I was able to put all the scientific references to the book. I know this stuff sounds impossible to believe. I'm sure people would be calling BS, but my publisher allowed me to put about 450 scientific references with videos, with pictures available all for free. There's breathing methods all for free. There's interviews with experts in the field because I'm just a reporter all for free on the website, Mr. Jamesnester.com. I'm trying to get better at the Instagram thing at Mr. Mr. James Nestor. There it is. So I'll put those links in the show notes as well. Thank you very much for coming on. This has been great. Thanks a lot for having me. Cheers.